Did you bless that other church or did you make an enemy? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> they haven't called me since. <laughs> <laughs> well, amen. Had we had time, I would have tried to contact Brother Hayden and ask him if it would be okay if our brother would preach tonight, but we better stay in order. Amen. amen. Better stay in order. <clears throat> Romans chapter 16, if you would, please. <clears throat> We're going to operate the best we can time-wise tonight, but I want to say to you that... that uh, the Lord lives in a, the Lord functions in eternity. We function in time. We're going to go on His clock tonight. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you as we start tonight. The first one is: Is would you help me with a brief survey? Would you? Would you? Would you? You don't know. All right, I'll ask my second question then. <laughs> How many times is the word relationship, don't punch it up in your, in, your, in your phone or whatever now. Don't do that, please. How many times is the word relationship found in the King James Bible? Would you say 50 times? No takers. How about 25 times? How about 10 times? Anybody got a, how about five times? Y'all aren't helping me. <laughs> the answer is zero. The answer is zero. I'm sorry? <laughs> the answer is zero. I checked that on four different programs that search the word of God. Relationship is found zero times in the King James Bible. Have you heard of late the, one of the trends of, of uh, evangelicalism? They talk about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to say to you, that could be a good term. That also can be a term that can be twisted and used in any way that somebody wants it to be used. I'm concerned about words and their being misused. And I, I don't want to get off into that very deeply tonight at all. But soon after my wife and I were saved, I was introduced to a word in the, in the Sunday school literature that we were used called Synergism. Synergism. Synergism is a good word. But if I use the word synergism in a message, how many of you would understand what I was saying? About four people. There's a danger in that. And you see, the danger is evangelicals take words and modernists take words and liberals take words and they put a different meaning to them. And they teach their people their meaning. And may I say to you, that's one of the quickest roads to hell that I know of. May I say to you, you could take the word relationship, and it would mean something completely different to a liberal. It would mean something completely different to a Jehovah's Witness. It means something completely different to a Mormon. And it certainly means something different to a Catholic. See, the, the relationship with Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church goes through the wafer and the cup. And then there's a church here in our town, according to a, someone that I witnessed to that goes to that church, that they say that they encounter Christ. Now, boy, could you take that word and go 100 miles with it? 
and end up in the wrong spot. But the word relationship is a good word. It's a good word. And I want to go through, first, uh, through Romans chapter 16 a bit tonight and show you some relationships, if I could, to some words and to some people. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, an amazing man. And in this 16th chapter, he... he greets or commends or, or recognizes, if you will, a number of people. And it's amazing how he does so. And in each situation, there's a relationship. Now, rather than saying, for me, I don't use the term, do you have a relationship with Christ? Back when my wife and I got saved, and for several years thereafter, we would say, are you saved? Amen. I remember one preacher used to say, are you converted? That's a word that can be used in a lot of different ways. May I say to you, in the day in which we live, even the word repentance is in suppose fundamental circles is dissected and trisected and given up in ways that confuses people. I don't know why, but I was made privy to some information about a, a particular lady. I use the word lady. I don't want to be offensive. Her name's Kathy Lee Gifford. You all know who Kathy Lee Gifford is. She married Frank Gifford, a professional football player. And she was on TV for years. Have I got it right, class? She has written a book called The Jesus I Know. And it's touchy-feely. And may I say to you, I don't have to read the book. I got another bit of information. She was on a particular television program introducing her own brand of wine. And she called it GIF. Now, may I say to you, I have little confidence in that. But I have a lot of confidence in the Apostle Paul. Amen. A lot of it. I want you to notice in Romans, have you got your Bibles open to Romans chapter 16? I'm going to, I'm going to be a bit boring tonight. You're going to have to think with me. All right? I like to be a little challenging, but tonight we're going to be... Uh, uh, Kind of digging a little bit. Romans 16 was, as I commended you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the, Lord, of the church, which is at Centuria, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a succor of many, and of myself also. Great Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epineus, who is the first fruits of Achaia, unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much honor on us, Salute Andronicus and, and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, and are of note among the apostles, which also were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelias, my beloved in the Lord. I'm going to stop there. 
And we'll, we'll get into the re- some of the rest of the chapter, but I'm going to stop there for now so we can get started in the message. Let's pray. Now, Father, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, burden these people, but our Father, it's good for Christians to think. And so our, pro- our, our Father tonight, would you open our minds, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you communicate this message? Our Father, if you don't do it, it won't be done. So we ask you, Father, to to do your work. May our Father, we do our part in opening our ears, applying our minds, and committing this time to thee. Our Father, I, I desperately need you to guide us through this time, these few minutes ahead. I pray that you'll reap the profits of it, and we'll say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, I'm going to be looking at some relationships through some words in our text. If we, as we start in the first verse of, of Romans chapter 16, it says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is in Centuria. A servant of the church, a diaconos. Someone who serves. Someone who's known for service. Now this, this is not news to you. But I want you to understand, precious people, that the Apostle Paul uses this here, and then he will not use this particular term again, as best I can tell, through this chapter, as he introduces us to various other people to whom he expresses appreciation. So may I say to you, let's take note. Because because this lady Phoebe, according to verse 2, was a a special lady. Notice with me, if you would, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. May I say to you, that word sucker there has ca- captured my attention. This is a feminine word. It deals with females. May I say to you, she was a woman, according to this word, that had means and that she used them to help other people in service of the Lord. May I say to you, May God increase her lot. Phoebe. Not only did she help them materially, but she would help them spiritually. I have not met many Phoebes in my lifetime. My wife and I now have been saved over 50 years. Let's see. That would be 54 years now, I guess. She's young, but I'm old. And may I say to you, we've been in many churches. I've met few Phoebes. I don't know why it is, but for some, many ladies, it's difficult for them to put themselves forward and to express themselves in other people's lives. Now, I try to do that. I try to do that personally. But I'm not a woman. And believe it or not, there are some things about you women that I know very little about. And there are some things that I'm not very helpful with, but a woman could be. I've watched my wife. I've watched her quietly and without recognition. Is this thing working? Okay. And without recognition, help other people. Now, my wife will not put herself forward in that way spiritually so much. But there are people in this church that my wife has handed $100 bills when we couldn't afford it. And I want to say to you, I praise people like that. Because may I say to you, there are times in people's lives when a $100 bill is like, like a mountain of money. Some of you think 
I need more than a hundred dollar bill. Well, you take what you can get, amen. And if it comes from us, it probably won't be more than that. But may I say to you, she ministered to women. Now, there's a scripture verse that says that the older women are supposed to teach the younger women how to love their husbands, right? That would be wonderful. But then I want you to notice the next people we come to is Aquila and Priscilla. It says, my helpers in Christ Jesus. We'll get to the helper matter later in the text. But notice in verse 4 it says, who have, lay, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I want to say to you, if you traveled with the Apostle Paul, you better be ready to pray, preach, or die on a moment's notice. May I say to you, he would get you into situations. Priscilla was used mighty of the Lord, if you know their stories, just to some degree, don't you? But I want to say to you, the Apostle Paul had a special relationship with Aquila and Priscilla because of their devotion to the Lord and their willingness to sacrifice their very lives for the cause of Christ. I've not met many people in my lifetime, that would literally give their life that the cause of Christ might go forward. I've met some. But that crowd's pretty small. And the Apostle Paul is, is very right to, to salute these people, Aquila and Priscilla. And then you drop down to verse 6. For it says, greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Now, I suppose that you could take that and go different directions with it, but the word Mary captured my attention. There were Marys that followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And they, of their substance ministered to him. That, I think, is the thing that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. He didn't say they bestowed much labor for us. They bestowed much labor on us. On his person. See, the Apostle Paul had to eat, too. <clears throat> he might have had to have a change of clothes Occasionally. <coughs> Pardon me, I shouldn't get that excited. <coughs> but boy, I'm telling you, people are special that bestow much labor on someone else. <clears throat> Salute Andronicus and, and Andronicus and Juna, my kinsmen, and fellow prisoners. I guess they've been in jail with him. I've never been in jail as far as being locked up. <clears throat> But can you imagine going to jail with somebody else for preaching the gospel? That's what apparently happened here. Fellow prisoners. Now notice this next phrase here. Actually, it's a clause. Who are of note among the apostles? Now, the situation in the early church was different than what we experience today. And the apostles in Jerusalem were a special group of people. God ministered through them in ways that, that uh, we, we aren't ministered through. The apostles were special people. I'll leave it at that tonight.
But I want you to notice, they took note of these people. Then it goes on to say, who also were in Christ before me. That little prepositional phrase, in Christ. In Christ. How many times in the Word of God, I didn't check it, but it, is that, does that phrase show up? Preacher, do you have any idea? A bunch. In Christ. If you're in Christ, you're saved. <clears throat> the words in, in the Lord or in Christ. In verse 18, it says, Ampelius, uh, Ampelius, or whatever it is, my beloved in the Lord, in Christ, in the Lord, that equals being saved. In Acts 16, 31, the question is, what must I do to be saved? The answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice with me quickly, if you would, verses 11 and 12 of our text, where it says in the last part of that, verse 11, which are in the Lord. In verse 12, labored much in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. May I say to you, those people will be at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. They'll not appear at the great white throne judgment. They'll be there to be rewarded for the deeds done in the body. In the Lord. But I want you to notice in verse 8 there where it says, Greet and Pelias, my beloved. I want to spend a little time on that word, beloved. <clears throat> I went a long time in my Christian life before I understood that word. I never noticed it much. You know, it just seems like the word loved, right? There's a difference. <coughs> in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, it says, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice came out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Notice the word beloved there. Is there a special relationship between God the Father and God the Son? It's a different relationship than our word agape, the word love. I'm going to try to illustrate to you tonight that this is of great significance to people like me and you. <coughs> In John chapter 17, you might want to turn to this, this particular scripture. In John chapter 17, verse 23, I want you to notice. You found it? John 17, 23. <clears throat> I and them, that's the same thing as being in Christ, if Jesus is speaking, I am, amen. And thou in me, if you would, that they may be made perfect in one. Now notice this. That the world may know that thou hast sent me. Now notice this. And hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now I want you to get this. Jesus said... On the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my what son? Beloved son. Now notice here, in John 17, 23, the last of that verse says, and has loved them. Now the them there is his sheep. 
That's us. Notice this. He loved them as thou hast loved me. You and I are in the beloved. I can prove that to you very simply if you go to Romans chapter 1. Do that, would you please? Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Romans 1 verse 7. <clears throat> I want you to notice this. This is, this is such good stuff. It says, to all that be in Rome, what's the next word? Yeah. Beloved of God. Now, that's a particular group of people. He's not addressing everybody in Rome. He's addressing the beloved in the Lord, right? In Rome. It says, now, it says this group of people is called what? Saints. Are you a saint or are you an ain't? Now, quite frankly, if you're saved, you're a saint. Amen. That's clearly taught in the Word of God. And may I say to you, I'm a part of the beloved. Amen. Now that's a special kind of love. It's even more special than the love of a mother for a child. In fact, I don't know how to describe this word to, to give to you <coughs> so that we can understand how great a position you and I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Brother Longmire, if the Lord's going to kick out you, a beloved, what's he going to have to do to Christ? Now you talk about eternal security. Now, either you're a saint or you ain't. Are you saved? Then you're a part of the beloved. And he loves you. My Savior and my God love you with the very same love that he loves his only begotten son with. That's a pretty tight-knit group, isn't it? Wow. Are you with me? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and back in Romans chapter 16, if you would, please, and verse 9. We're going to go on with some more relationships here. I, I could stop right there, and that would be enough. Amen. <clears throat> Romans sixteen nine it says, "Salute or bene, our helper <clears throat> in Christ, and Syntychus, my beloved." Now this word helper here is the Greek word synergos. Now don't don't don't. Let that impress you, folks. You can go to the, to the same source as I do and get this same stuff, you know. You don't have to be a Greek scholar. Now, I would like to say to you, I took two years of Greek, but it might be better if I said two years of Greek took me. <laughs> I was told... <clears throat> Don't take Greek in summer school. Guess what I did? <laughs> and if you drop your pencil in Greek class in summer school, you're two weeks behind. Wow. Wow. 
But nonetheless, this word sunagos <coughs> is made up of, uh, uh, of a couple of words. It's a prefix in the word. Do you understand that? Do you all understand that? The word soon means with. And the word, <coughs> excuse me, ergos comes a word from the word ergo, or, which means work work and so he is saying to this one he, he's asking them to salute that he was a helper in Christ that meant with works can you hear me alright was it you this morning that said show me my faith by my, without your works I'll show you my faith by my works Look, works for a saved person are absolutely essential. Verse 10, <coughs> salute Ap Apuleius, Apellus, I don't know how you pronounce that, but you see it there, you got it? Notice the next word. Approved in Christ. Approved in Christ. Now listen, precious friends. I don't mind telling you. I like being approved. You do too? <laughs> but this is a little special because... This is approved in Christ. Let's talk about it a bit. I didn't bring any change. When I come to church on Sunday, my pockets are basically empty. My wife's got the checkbook, though. <laughs> a coin. You think anybody got a coin? Oh, there's one here. Hey, how about that? I'll put it in my pocket. No, I won't. This is a quarter. I don't know how many millions of these are, are coined, minted every year. But there are bunches and bunches of them. They're all the same size and they're all the same weight. Okay? Back in the old days when they minted a coin, it was a lot more crude. They would pour hot metal into a mold and... And and they didn't fit just real 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 well sometimes and sometimes where they would the mold would come together out the cracks would would there would be you understand don't you be a little bit of molten stuff come out and then it would solidify okay and then they would they would trim that stuff off but the crooks sometime would take the the uh, coin, and they would trim off the edges and then put it aside and still pass the coin off with the same amount. And after a while, they'd gather up enough material to make another coin. Is that what you call a crook? <laughs> but this word teaches us that this gentleman was found genuine. He had not been trimmed off, nothing had been shaved off. He was full-blown, and he was for Christ. He was tested and found genuine. Genuine. This quarter I'm holding here is mostly, what is that, copper in the middle? It's not worth a quarter anymore. You know? And now who's the crook? Excuse me. <laughs> but he was found genuine. Wow. Approved in Christ. I've heard people say, 
in my years of being a Christian that you can't tell whether somebody else is saved or not. And I disagree with that vehemently. Paul knew that Timothy was saved. Check it out. The Apostle Paul is saying here that Apelles or Apelles, however, is approved in Christ. He is 100% genuine. How about us? Has the world trimmed some off of our edges and we still, we still want another fistful of the world? Or are we genuine? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God? Do you do that when you dress for church? And on we could go. Well, relationships. Amen. Paul's suiting some in, in interesting people in interesting ways. <clears throat> Oops, I shouldn't do that. I should do this. If I was included in this text, what would the Apostle Paul say to me? But yeah, I don't want to be found wanting. Amen. Now, I read this week where it takes a good while in the Christian life, it seems, for people to be discerning. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm amazed at what preachers get away with in their churches in directing your people in ways that are contrary to the word of God. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how little discernment that Baptists have sometimes. Look down at verse 17 in chapter 16 of the book of Romans. And it says, now I beseech you, brethren, by mark them, mark them, mark them that cause division and offense, offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and what? And avoid them. Paul gave us some exceedingly good examples in the first part of Romans 16. Amen? And then he says, watch out. There's that bunch of booglers that try to steal the glory from God. And it's contrary, Paul says, to the doctrine which you have learned. May I say to you, we don't automatically know what Bible doctrine is, do we? We've got to learn it. And it takes time. May I give you just a, a little bit of a sidelight here? <clears throat> Outside of Brother Drummond here and some others that I'm not going to mention because I'd get my head shaved. I'm one of the older ones. You see, I can't dare say anything about some that are sitting over there in that corner. <laughs> and I'll get it now. <clears throat> Mrs. Basham, you got your hearing aids turned up? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
We'll work it out, won't we? <laughs> but I'm not concerned anymore about what I know. I'm more concerned about what I probably don't know. I don't know how much a person can learn about our wonderful Savior. I don't know. But I'm concerned when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ that I may come up wanting. Therefore, I've kind of adopted a verse in the Bible. Philippians 3.10, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I have to suffer to know Christ. Does that startle you? Some things you only learn through suffering. I'm concerned about what I don't know because I, I wonder if I'm discerning enough. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I can that I can pick out what takes up what somebody is saying and be discerning enough to expose them immediately. Sometimes I have to ponder on it. Now I'm not alone in that. But oh, that I would know the difference quickly. Now, if it comes to doctrine, I don't know it all. I'm not a know-it-all, but I know some. And I know enough when, to know when something rings true and when it doesn't. Can you hear me all right? So mark them that cause division and offense among you. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them, Paul says. That's another relationship. Right. <clears throat> Oops. I'm going to take a little bit more time. I'm going to talk about three relationships in my life. I could talk about hundreds. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about three tonight. <clears throat> the three Fergusons. <clears throat> In my growing up days, My family lived on a small farm. Two houses east of us lived John and Mabel Ferguson, father, daughter. One day, I was a little shaver. I was not very big. <clears throat> and I saw John Ferguson planting corn with a team of horses. Now, you say, Brother Rinker, are you that old? Well, I'm telling you a true story. <clears throat> and I saw him come to the end, and he... <clears throat> Had to fill up the, fill up, the, put the corn seed in the, in the boxes, containers for the corn seed on the planter. And John Ferguson <coughs> did that walking on his knees. And I asked my mother, <clears throat> why 
why is he doing that on his knees? And she said, well, he's old. And after he gets so tired, he just can't walk on his feet. I've never forgotten that. But I want to tell you about his daughter, Mabel. I'd met to you for the for, for a good while in my in my younger years. I thought they were husband and wife. I found out that they were father and daughter. <coughs> well, Mabel took care of her dad. <coughs> they lived in a house there. <coughs> I had just most, I had never been inside their house, just had gone by it on the road, and it set off the road there, I don't know, a couple hundred feet or something. But one day I went there. I don't know why now, but Mabel was fixing breakfast on a wood burning cook stove. And she was making oatmeal for the cats. I don't know why, I don't remember now what she was fixing for her and her father, but she was making oatmeal for the cat. <coughs> Excuse me, they had some cats. <coughs> I looked over by the door that went to the outside. <coughs> <coughs> uh, forgive me for my struggling, I've got a phlegm issue. There was a hole there, brother, about that big that went directly outside. That's the kind of a house they lived in. <coughs> when I graduated from the eighth grade, <coughs> my mother came to that graduation service and you know who she brought? She brought Mabel Ferguson. And Mabel Ferguson brought me a pocket knife. <clears throat> now, look, these were poor people. I'm telling you, they were, we, we didn't have anything extra at our house. But these people were poor people. And she brought me a pocket knife. <clears throat> Mabel had three teeth right up here. That was all she had in her head. But she liked me. I have wished a million times that I had known then what I know now about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't know. I grew up in a church that said you need to <coughs> get baptized and join the church. They didn't know the first thing about getting saved. That's a relationship. The second Ferguson is Paul Ferguson. <coughs> Paul Ferguson, I met when I was in, in Bible school and Bible college at Tennessee Temple. Paul Ferguson was older than, than we, and he was working in evangelism. Paul Ferguson was a champion welterweight boxer before he got saved. And sometimes when he'd speak, he'd have lapses. And the reason is because his brain had been bounced around inside his cranium so much. But he got saved. And boy, the Lord touched his heart. 
he memorized bunches and bunches of verses in the Bible. <coughs> he went to Dr. Robertson one day, and he said, Dr. Robertson, I've, I've memorized these verses. And, it was, and he had a huge list. And he said, I pray, I pray every day. And he used a, a time amount in, in the conversation. And he said to Dr. Robertson, he said, do you think God can use me? And boy, did God use Paul Ferguson. My wife and I went to a revival meeting that Paul Ferguson was preaching on Signal Mountain, just outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. They had built a new auditorium, and Paul Ferguson was preaching the inaugural revival meeting in that, in that new church building. A young lady there, she, I sat beside her, and Paul Ferguson was doing the preaching. And he got, to, he got to preaching, and I got to saying amen. And that young lady looked over at me and said, why are you saying amen? He's, he's preaching about all the things that we're not doing. That was Paul Ferguson. Paul Ferguson was used. He stayed busy preaching revival meetings. Yeah, he stuttered occasionally, but boy, he got the message across. That's a relationship. The third relationship is Larry Ferguson. Larry's not his name. Larry could be alive yet today, so I'm not going to use his name. <coughs> Larry came to Tennessee Temple. Larry was just about this tall. And he was an afflicted young man. <clears throat> there were some complications during his birth, and, and he walked kind of like this. His last name, Ferguson. He had... He had some difficulty saying some letters. And the one letter that he had a lot of trouble with was the letter F. And his last name was Ferguson. He went with us one night to a rescue <coughs> mission. <coughs> and I had Larry introduce himself. And it was amazing to watch him. He said, my name is Larry, and then he turned his head sidewise and said, F Ferguson. And he was from Florida. Now, one Thursday evening, we went on visitation on Thursdays evenings. And Larry and I teamed up one Thursday evening, and we went into a, a room by ourselves to pray before we went. <clears throat> and Larry got to praying, got to confessing some things. And one of the things that he confessed to the Lord was, are you listening? Lord, forgive me for not going to the laundromat and passing out tracts. Now, if that doesn't get your gizzard, I don't know what will. I cherished that relationship with Larry. He didn't make it through Bible college. He, he academically could not do the work. But I want to tell you, I can still remember 
him walking down the street in his way with one of the learned instructors there at school and a couple of other students, and they were talking about spiritual stuff. And guess who was leading the conversation? It was little Larry. Hey, I, I got a question I want to ask you. What's our problem? That's a relationship. I'm done. How's your relationship with the Lord, precious people? How is it? How is it? Thank you, Father, for this time together. Bless these precious folks. I pray you'll bless these precious people. Thank you. So many of them have a mind to work. Our Father, would you <clears throat> give some of us whatever it is we need that we might be able to help others to come to a place where they can serve the Lord acceptably and be comfortable with it in the Lord. Father, for someone here that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray they've been convicted tonight of their sin and would come to Christ for the forgiveness of that and to obtain eternal life through repentance and faith. Have your precious way, I pray. Thank you, my Father. Thank you, Father, for including us in the Beloved. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Ken, would you be kind enough to come and we'll sing a song, please. I don't know. Do you need to respond? Do you need to come? Do business with the Lord. Whatever you need to do, just do it. Amen? Just do it. Hymn 431. 431, make me a servant like you, dear Lord. 431, let's stand please to sing.